So every fan of Mavis Gallant has uh, their favorite lines. And I wanted to share with you a few of mine before we start. This one is about uh, an aspiring actor that one of her characters meets in Paris. He must have learned to smile and glance and give his full attention when he was still very young. Perhaps he charmed his mother that way. This is about a socialist boyfriend who refuses to take his girlfriend to a decent restaurant in Paris. He wanted everyone in the world to have enough to eat, but he did not want them to enjoy what they were eating. <laughs> this is uh, about an assistant headmaster from Britain in an English boys' school in Quebec. If he had not actually fought in the Spanish War, he had surely thought about it. <laughs> and this is one of the shortest, but one of my favorites, just the way it nails the characterization. This is about an old British woman uh, living out her days with a good friend of hers in an Italian pension. <coughs> Mrs. Freeport pursed her lips in acknowledgement of the cheese. You've met this woman, I guarantee it. <laughs> this is uh, an American living in France, and he's thinking here uh, about his French landlady. He admired Madame Pegare, confusing her because she was old and French and had once been rich with courts and courtesans in the 18th century. In her presence, his mind took a literary turn and he thought of vanished glories, something fine that would never return, gallant, flattering banners, and the rest of it. It's that, and the rest of it, that nails it, that the vagueness of his imagination, the precision of hers. Uh, the New York Times art critic, Vivian Rayner, um, said of Mavis Gallant that she sees people through an unblinking reptilian eye and can express a personality or a whole life in one or two deadly sentences. Reptilian is a bit much, but, but only a bit. Um, she was born Mavis Young in Montreal in 1922. Her, her father was probably Captain Albert Young, who was a British immigrant to Montreal who sold office furniture and claimed that he was a, a painter, an artist, and did some on the side, but mostly sold office furniture. Until quite recently, we thought that her mother was American, and very few people knew her name, partly because Mavis very rarely spoke the name of her mother and talked very rarely about her. In 2015, uh, Stephen Hennigan discovered that her mother was a woman by the name of Benedictine, or Benny, the name she went by, Weissman, who was a Canadian, not an American, of ethnic German heritage, who said that she was Romanian. When Benny, her mother, was a teenager, she ran away from home in Montreal and went to Toronto, where she dressed and worked as a man, using the name Jimmy. She was here for six, seven months. Some pedestrians saw her on the street, dressed as a man, realized that she was a woman, and this is the 1930s, complained to police. She was taken to the courts, and she was arrested, and she was sent back to Montreal to her parents, properly garbed. Eight years later, her mother was arrested again this time in upstate New York, for cohabiting with a married man. Also a crime at the time. Eight years, uh, she served, her mother served three years in prison. Um, pardon me, that's a mistake. Three months in prison. Still heinous. And, and was deported back home to Canada, where she seems to have met and married Captain Young pretty much in the train station. Mavis was born the following summer and she is their only child. 
At age four, her mother sent her to a French language boarding school. Uh, Gallant told an interviewer that the only thing I remember is my mother putting me on a chair and saying, I'll be back in 10 minutes. She never came back, ever. Um, Gallant has said uh, in the few rare comments she has made about her mother, she said simply that I had a mother who should not have had children. Uh, she was also the only English Canadian at this school and the only Protestant at this school. Um, so in her words, she suffered enormously. Her father died in 1932, uh, possibly at his own hand. There's a lot we still don't know about her early life. Her mother told her, sorry, she's back in her life at this point. Her mother told her, she ne her mother never told her that her father had died. He told her that he, he had gone to England. She told her that he'd gone to England. And it took her some time before she learned that her father was in fact dead. Her mother um, married a man with whom she had been having an affair, and she packed now 10-year-old Mavis off to a succession of relatives and boarding schools in Canada and the United States, something in the order of a dozen or more different schools and boarding schools. She ended up in New York City at the Julia Richmond High School for Girls on the Upper East Side. Uh, they expelled her for truancy. I'm not sure what happens after this. Uh, nobody is. But we do know that she finished high school in farming country near Poughkeepsie, again in upstate New York, in the uh, first year of the Second World War, 1939. When she was 18 years old, she returned on her own to Montreal. By this point, uh, well, by her early teens, all contact with her mother had been severed. And as far as we know, they did not communicate with each other for the rest of their lives. She got her own apartment in downtown Montreal, and she worked for the Canadian National Railway, and later for the National Film Board. She got married at the age of 20. She married a man by the name of Johnny Gallant. That's why she's Mavis Gallant. Johnny Gallant was an Acadian from Winnipeg. Uh, he was a jazz musician and he was the uh, regular jazz pianist at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Montreal. That's how they met. She was a big jazz fan. With uh, Johnny uh, en enlisted, and he went away to war. And with so many other men gone with him, Mavis got a job in 1944 as a feature reporter at a weekly Montreal newspaper called The Standard. And that's probably where that picture was taken and when. She wrote about nurses in the Yukon, uh, war brides arriving in Halifax, the fashion for Freud, unwanted pregnancy, the Dion couplets, urban poverty, Hugh McLennan. Uh, she had a pretty serious socialist and even communist bent in these years. And that, together with the fact that unlike anybody else who worked for the Standard, she spoke fluent French, uh, took her into a lot of places that the reporter of the paper had not previously been able to go. When uh, Johnny came back from the war, they realized pretty quickly that they had pretty much nothing in common other than a shared affection for jazz, and they divorced amicably in 1948. Uh, she never remarried. She decided that journalism was a life I liked, but not the one I wanted, she said. And in the spring of 1950, she gave her notice of the standard, and she mailed a short story to The New Yorker. She had published maybe three stories at this point, uh, one in a, that I know of in a small Montreal literary magazine, and one in the standard that was also read on CBC radio. Uh, but she'd write in them constantly without showing them to anybody. But she has virtually no track record. And here she is sending a story to The New Yorker. Her plan was to send the New Yorker three stories. If they rejected all three of them, that would be that. She would quit. Uh, they liked the first story, and they asked to see one more. They bought that one. They bought the second story. The New Yorker paid her $600 for the story. You have to remember that 
you know, at this time, her pay at the standard was $50 a week. $600 is a big deal. Uh, she went to Burke's, and she bought herself a red alligator bag with gold trim on it uh, for $75. In the fall of 1950, she's 28 years old. She left Montreal for Europe. Um, she seems to have had some help from the senior editor at The Standard, uh, whose wife was concerned about the time he's, he was spending in her company. So he got her an, an air, ticket on Air Canada um, to leave the country. So she left in 1950. She had a typewriter, a year's pay with the help of her boss, and of course a hell of a nice purse. <laughs> she gave herself two years to find out if she could make a living as a writer. Uh, becoming a writer in Canada never even occurred to her. She wrote in the Standard in one article about Hugh McLennan that Canadian writing never hurt anyone's feelings. After a false start in London, she chose Paris because to her it seemed like a clean break, a place where absolutely nobody knew her and she knew nobody. And and they had towards, as her career picked up, whenever she came to Canada, interviewers would routinely ask her, you know, why Paris? Why did you move to Paris? Why do you stay in Paris? Every interview asked this question. And I think she got tired of the question because eventually she'd just answer with, have you ever been to Paris? <laughs> this is my favorite picture of her. That's her on uh, Ile Saint-Louis, uh, about 1960. She met Richler, she saw Richler there. Um, they hung out in some of the places. They had been introduced, uh, Mordecai Richler, they had been introduced by a mutual friend in Montreal because who knew that they were both planning to go to Paris, so they were introduced before then. She liked him, but thought he was a bit of a brat. She spent much of the next 10 years roaming around Europe, uh, cheap hotels and pensions, uh, writing the notes in her journal that became the people and the places of her fiction, often stories about other wanderers like herself. When she published her first collection in 1956, nine of its 12 stories had already appeared in The New Yorker. By the mid-60s, she had published over 40 stories in the magazine, and they had signed her to what is called a first reading agreement, something that Alice Monroe also acquired many years later with The New Yorker. It simply means that the magazine gets first look at anything that she writes. It's not a guarantee of publication, it just means she shows it to them first. The New Yorker, as far as I and others have been able to count, ultimately printed 116 short stories by Mavis Gallant. And that appears to be uh, behind only two other writers, and that is John O'Hara and John Updike. Uh, there's an unpublished New Yorker cartoon that I've never seen, but have read descriptions of, uh, and despite my best efforts with the New Yorker, I've not been able to find. Uh, they think it was actually never published in the magazine. It was probably made, made for her as a joke. But it's a cartoon that shows two uh, bored Manhattan socialites sitting around a, a, a restaurant in downtown, a restaurant table in downtown Manhattan, and the caption says, Mavis Gallant in the New Yorker, every so often, is all the Canadian culture I can stand. <laughs> uh, she lived in Paris for the rest of her life, uh, mostly in a rented apartment on the left bank between Montparnasse and Saint-Germain-des-Prés. She published two novels and several novellas, but the short story is her home. Uh, it is her most comfortable place of publication and where she was at her best. Many of the stories are about expatriates, people like herself. Uh, people who are on holidays or people who are on the move. They're portraits of homeless people, even when they're shown at home. Like Richler, uh, she has no obvious Canadian literary influences. There weren't any, or none that she was interested in. In her late teens, early 20s, she spent a lot of time reading the Russians in translation, Dostoevsky, Turgenev, Gogol, Chekhov. There's a wave of French writers that comes a little bit after that, Stendhal, 
Flaubert and her absolute favorite, Proust. Um, there's a very good article about Catherine Mansfield's influence on her early work. The biggest and most lasting influence on her writing was her journalism. And I mean that in several senses. First, many of her early stories were drawn directly from subjects that she had already written about in her journalism. She used her journalism for stories that she could but they give, give subjects for her stories, people and events that she observed. But it's more than just the subject. When she first got to Paris, uh, she stayed in a hotel in Saint-Germain-des-Prés that had been recommended to her by a musician friend of Johnny's. She left the hotel uh, after just a month because she was concerned that she was living in Paris but spending all of her time with English and American expatriates, people like Richler. And she wanted to know Paris. So she went to the Canadian Embassy, and at that time, maybe they still do, I don't know, they had a book there of uh, French people who went, lent it out, rented out apartments to people from outside of Paris who wanted to find a home with them. This is her talking about that. I went to the Canadian Embassy, and they had a book there of French people who wanted to rent rooms in their apartments. I found a room that looked all right. I wanted a good bourgeois family who had roots in France, in Paris, so I could study them. I sound as if I was collecting butterflies. <laughs> and that's literally what she did for the rest of her writing life. Observe people extremely closely and then write about them in her journals. Having tea or a drink with Mavis Galan must have been a frightening experience, <laughs> especially when you saw the notebook come out. Um, she's collecting butterflies. She's writing the notes in her notebooks that became the precisely observed people and places of her fiction. And that's why her portraits are so precise. That's why that reptilian eye is so reptilian, because they began in observation, not from her imagination, but from actual journalism. Because it is based uh, on observation, most of her fiction is autobiographical. And what I mean by that is simply that her stories are set in her time, in places that she actually went to, and they're about people that she saw. Some of them are directly autobiographical uh, about her, and especially a sequence of stories that she wrote over many years all about the same character, a young woman by the name of Lynette Muir, called the Lynette Muir Stories. And the parallels between Lynette's lives and Mavis Gallant's lives are, are, are there's many. Um, like Gallant, Lynette is an only child from Montreal who is estranged from her mother. Like Gallant, she was sent to a French boarding school at the age of four, um, and her father died when she was 10. Like Gallant, she marries at 20, and she works in a Montreal newspaper, and she becomes a writer. Gallant has said that Lynette Muir is not myself, but a kind of summary of the things that I once was. That is something that Alice Munro could have said about Del Jordan uh, and a number of her other earlier characters. Gallant and Munro are very different writers, but what they have in common, besides their shared affection for the short story, is that to them, I think, fiction is not really fiction. Not at all. It's an attempt to tell the truth, to get as close to the truth as you actually. They're not stories. Um, not to them. It's the truth about real people in real places, including themselves. And that's why the writing is often difficult and why they're often difficult to read, because the truth is hard. Describing what Gallant's stories are about is fairly easy. Um, describing how they do it is much, much harder. Many writers of her generation adored Hemingway. And many of them, not surprisingly, therefore, ended up sounding like Hemingway themselves when they first began writing, including Mordecai Richler. Many writers now and then love Mavis Gallant. She is what they call a writer's writer. I don't know of anybody who imitates her, because she can't be. It's very hard. I can't imagine anybody easily imitating her style, partly because it is born of that observation. If you don't do the homework, you can't imitate the style. When her selected stories came out in 1996, Anne Hulbert, 
in the New York Times called Gallant an anomaly, a writer of short stories who has no interest in the economical art of telling a story. I know what she means, but it seems wrong to me to describe one of the masters of the short story uh, as uneconomical. Um, Gallant said herself that most of her work was deleting. That doesn't sound like uneconomical to me. Um, I think what Hulbert really means is that for Gallant, for starters, the story takes as long as it takes. And that's why, for example, many of her stories are much longer than conventional short stories, 10,000 words or more. The same is true of Alice Munro. It's one of the other reasons why the two of them publish so much in The New Yorker, because unlike a lot of other magazines, The New Yorker is actually willing to publish stories of that length. Her stories also tend not to follow the traditional arc of a short story, introduction, climax, denouement. The, the, there's a story in her first collection that's called The Picnic, and it's a good example of what I'm talking about. It's one of her many stories that would disappoint a reader who is looking for an introduction and a middle and an end. Uh, it, it's about an American family living in Paris for the summer, and they're preparing to go on a picnic that the story never gets to. And that's very common in her fiction, because she is more interested in what she sees along the way than in the ultimate destination. The most obvious and consistent hallmark of her fiction is not structure, because it changes with every story in every collection. It's her voice. It's her style. It is a voice that she established in the first pages of the first story in her first collection. And this is a story about a young American woman in Paris who discovers that neither Paris nor her fiance is quite what she expected or quite what she wanted. And this is the first paragraph in the first story in her first collection. Carol, with great efficiency, nearly at once set about the business of falling in love. Love required only the right conditions, like a geranium. It would wither exposed to bad weather or in dismal surroundings. Indeed, Carol rated the chances of love in a cottage or a furnished room at zero. Given a good climate, enough money, and a pair of good-natured, intelligent, her college lectures had stressed this, people, one had only to sit back and watch it grow. All winter, then, she looked for these right conditions in Paris. When at first nothing happened, she blamed it on the weather. She was often convinced she would fall deeply in love with Howard if only it would stop raining. <laughs> Undaunted, she waited for better times. It is a voice that is clear, that is calculating, that is even cold at times, that is deeply ironic. Uh, what came to be called the New Yorker voice, ironically made best known by a Canadian writer. Robert Fulford has a lovely description of her voice. In his review of her second book, he calls it the kind of stylish, sophisticated prose that remains equally unruffled whether it describes a rape or a cocktail party. The Canadian novelist Janice Kulik Kiefer says in her book about Gallant that she doesn't get better and better as she goes along. She was preternaturally good to begin with. Again, I know what she means, but I don't think it's true, and I doubt very much that Mavis Gallant herself would have agreed. Even at her worst, which is pretty rare, because she was ruthless about not publishing stuff unless she was very happy with it, Gallant was better than any of her Canadian contemporaries at the kind of writing she did. Ethel Wilson might be the one exception. Better than most writers anywhere in the world in the English language. But The Other Paris, her first book, is still a first collection by a young writer. And it shows, mostly in an irony that is at times just a touch too heavy. Um, I don't know if you know that the, the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's like a young Buffy. She's supernaturally strong, but not yet fully in control of her powers. It's all very clever, but at times it's a bit too clever, turning her characters into objects of laughter instead of objects of sympathy. The trick, 
as she learned very quickly, is, of course, to make them both at the same time. People we can laugh at, people we can also feel for. Take Thank You for the Lovely Tea, which is a story that was also first published in 1956, and it's the story that she chose to begin her 1981 selection of her stories that were set in Canada. It's about three girls at a boarding school, a private boarding school, Ruth, Helen, and May. Ruth's wealthy father is divorced, and his friend, Mrs. Holland, has come to the school to take Ruth and her two friends out for tea. The first sentence of the story contains another hallmark of Gallant's fiction. That year, it began to rain on the 24th of May, a holiday still called some 30 years after her death, Queen Victoria's birthday. It rained, this was Canada, until the middle of June. There's that cleverness, right? That reptilian eye, the slightly mocking tone that you hear. The phrase, this was Canada, is, I believe, deliberately set in the wrong sentence. It's not explaining the rain. It rains a lot of places in June. It's explaining why the holiday is named after a long dead queen, because it's Canada, at a time when Canada was more British than the British. It's like a delayed punchline, something that's seeming to explain one thing, but it's actually explaining another thing. That's not what I wanted to point out. What I want to point out to you is that we know right away where, and especially when, the story takes place. Some 30 years after Queen Victoria's death in 1901, so we know that it's the 1930s. And two pages later, we will find out exactly what year it is because we are told that this is the year that King George and Rudyard Kipling have died. So we know that it's 1936. And that is very typical of Gallant stories. They're always located precisely in place and in time. She said, I can't imagine writing something that doesn't have a time attached, and I don't like reading something that could happen anytime, anywhere. This is her selected stories. And the stories in it are ordered chronologically. But unlike any other short story selection that I know of, they're ordered chronologically by date of setting, not by date of composition, which is extremely un I've literally never seen it before. I have learned to think of Mavis Gallant as a journalist or perhaps a historian, a social historian, who chose to write fiction. Her characters are distinguished less by individual personality, the things a writer imagines, than by the precise circumstances of their origins and their current place in society. Things like class, nation, ethnicity. That's what made her tick. She uses stories not to tell a story, but to understand people in their time and in their place. And that's what I meant about trying to get at the truth, that to her, like Monroe, stories are not really stories, not as we think of them. At first, you think that Thank You for the Lovely Tea is about Ruth, because that's who the story begins with a bored, spoiled, slightly cruel little rich girl waiting at her school for her father's girlfriend to pick her up and take her to tea while she had the opportunity to abuse her two friends. But the story keeps switching perspectives. It starts with Ruth, but then it takes us into the mind of Mrs. Holland, the father's mistress. Then it jumps into the mind of the new headmistress of the school who's trying to change the school and the girls with it. Then it goes into the minds of the other girls. And then it goes back to Ruth. And by the end of the story, it is very difficult to say who the main character of the story is at all, which is another sign of Gallant's lack of interest in conventional short stories. This is what Gallant said about narrative perspective. The events and characters in fiction are like works of art in a museum. You see them from different angles. You move around and around. You don't stand in the same place. 
And then she does that repeatedly, bringing the perspective of the narrator to bear on different characters, bringing different characters' perspective to bear on other characters. As a reader, once you're done all that moving around, it shifts your sense of what the story is about. You began thinking it's about Ruth, but by the end, you're not sure. Thank you for the lovely tea seems at first like a satiric story about a spoiled rich kid, and it is. But it is also a sympathetic story about a woman, Mrs. Holland, trying desperately to connect with the daughter of the man that she loves. It is also a story about a headmistress trying to figure out a new country and a new school. And it's also a story about a poor girl in the back of the car who doesn't have access to the kind of future that Ruth does. In his review of, of Mavis Gallant's second book, Robert Fulford admired the style, but he found her too detached. He said, Gallant can pinpoint the faults of her characters with cruel precision, but she cannot love them enough to make us feel that they are of real importance. There are some stories, especially the early stories, that I think Fulford is right about that. It doesn't bother me much, um, because I don't think that authors need to love their characters. But mostly, I think he's wrong. It can be very hard to see the compassion in Mavis Gallant's stories. But that does not mean that it's not there. She just doesn't like to point it out for you. And that's one of the differences between her fiction and, say, for example, commercial fiction, which is always telling you when and where to cry. Gallant leaves it up to you, and it's much harder. <laughs> but she cares. She published her first book in 1956. It's called The Other Paris. It was published in Boston by Houghton Mifflin. Um, this is the British edition, uh, which was published a year later by Mordecai Richler's publisher, Andre Douche. I assume, though I don't know, that he introduced them to her. This cover of the British edition was designed by Len Dayton, the future spy novelist Len Dayton, um, creator of Harry Palmer. Len Dayton began his career as a book designer and then moved into writing the books whose covers he was designing. It's a collection of 12 stories, nine of them, as I said, from The New Yorker. They're mostly about Americans in Europe with a, a few uh, in Quebec. The only review that I have found uh, which was in the London Spectator, was less than enthusiastic. It says, the stories are clever, witty, sympathetic, and all very fine until that mandatory New Yorker irony comes creeping through. Just occasionally, you wish that both she and Irwin Shaw would wipe that hint of a knowing smile off their faces. Fair criticism. Her second book is a short novel. Um originally published as three separate stories in The New Yorker. It's called Green Water, Green Sky, published in 1959. It's the story of a young American woman's descent into madness, uh, what Gallant herself would later identify as schizophrenia. And it's set against the rotting backdrop of an expatriate's Europe of the 1950s. It's Thomas Mann's Death in Venice with Americans. For Mann, for Thomas Mann, the rot that he saw in Europe was cultural. It was cultural decline. For Gallant, that's probably for me, for Gallant, <laughs> it's in families. And the disease is psychological, not cultural. She was a, a big reader of Sigmund Freud when she was younger. It's okay. She was a big reader of Sigmund Freud when she was younger. Everybody was a big reader of Sigmund Freud, especially of her class in education. By the time that she wrote this book, though, she was growing out of Sigmund Freud. And you can see it in the novel. It, it uses Freudian ideas to help explain the madness of the main character brought on by the typical Freudian suspects of an absent father and a domineering mother. But the few bits of topical satire 
that appear in the novel are aimed at psychoanalysis. So if you see what I mean, it uses psychoanalysis as sort of a structuring principle to explain how people get the way they are. But then it ends up laughing at people who are in therapy. And it's a sign of how she, both how much she took from Freud, but also the process she was working to work her way out from underneath Freud. It got good reviews by Robert Fulford in the Daily Star and Charles Poor in the New York Times, both of whom were her champions throughout her career. This is her third book, My Heart is Broken, published in 1964 and dedicated to her, her longtime editor at The New Yorker, a man by the name of William Maxwell, and the man that she attributed most of her career's success to. Gallant wrote stories, not books. So it is very hard to say which is her best book. This is a good candidate. Um, it's, got, uh, it's probably my favorite of her earlier collections. It has three outstanding stories in it. Bernadette, um, My Heart is Broken, and The Ice Wagon Going Down the Street. And it has a novella in it that is about as close to perfect as art gets. The Ice Wagon Going Down the Street is one of her best known stories. And I think that's partly because it's set in Canada, so why we like to read it, but also because it's different from most of her other stories. It makes her sympathy easier to see. It's not as cruel or ironic as her other stories. And I think that's part of the reason why it's been easier to embrace than the rest of her fiction. In 1968, she published two long articles in The New Yorker about the student protests in Paris in May. And these are based on notes that she took while wandering the streets in Paris in May of 68 during the strike or revolution or whatever it was. It's mostly details, uh, first-hand observations, with no attempt to put them together into an overall interpretation of history. It's just what she saw, the tear gas seeping down into the metro stations. A Belgian tourist getting his son to pose for a photograph on the remains of a barricade with a stone in each hand. Trees cut down, cars set on fire, paving stones lifted for barricades and for weapons. The world lost a great historian when Mavis Gallant chose to write fiction. She followed politics very closely. And all of her work is deeply political, although she usually avoided choosing sides. This is her next book, her second and last novel. It's called A Fairly Good Time, published in 1970. She can't keep the irony even out of her titles. A Fairly Good Time. It's about a Canadian woman in Paris in a failing marriage with a Frenchman, uh, a journalist, a jazz columnist. And besides her collected stories, this is the book that got the most and the best reviews of any of her other books. And I believe that's just because it's a novel. That is, the, the main reason it got more attention than the rest of her books is because it's not a collection of short stories. I also think it's her weakest book, just my opinion. I think she should have stuck to short fiction. But we live in a literary marketplace that rewards novels more than it does short fiction. Her third collection, published in 1973. This is The Pegnitz Junction, uh, five stories and uh, the title novella. They are what she called her German stories. One of my favorites in it is it's called The Old Friends, and it's about a, a Jewish concentration camp survivor having dinner with her old friend, who is a German police commissioner, um, and they're having dinner together many years after the war. Very, very poignant story. She described the book as a book about where fascism came from, not the historical causes of fascism. Again, she's not interested in theories of history. Just, she said, it's small possibilities in people, how a human being could become a fascist. There's a half dozen more books since then, selections by herself, and by others. The most complete is her 1996 Collected Stories, which was called Selected Stories in Canada for reasons I don't know. Um, chosen by herself, selected by, uh, selected by herself, 
and all but one of them previously published in the New Yorker. It's massive. You could hurt somebody with this book. It's nine, 900 pages long. I would say, if you're interested, the best short introduction to her work that is still in print, because many of her earlier books, which is the way I prefer to read them, I prefer to read short stories in the collections in which they originally appeared, rather than selections by others or by the author. But you can't anymore unless you haunt used bookstores. The best short introduction to her work that is still in print is a book called Varieties of Exile. And it was selected by the American writer Russell Banks and printed by the New York Review of Books. Avis Gallant wrote in English, but lived in French. She was almost entirely unknown in Paris as a writer. Most of her neighbors did not even know that she was a writer. She told an interviewer in 1977 that most of her European friends, of whom she had many, in the arts, arts community in particular, had never heard of The New Yorker. She made her living entirely from writing. No grants, no academic ties or support, other than one writer-in-residence position here at the University of Toronto that went very badly for all concerned. She hated it. Most of her books are now out of print, as I said, and they have been for a long time. All you can get is her collected stories and several selections by others. She was pretty much broke when she died um, in 2014 at the age of 91. She didn't need much to live on, but she had nothing when she left. Uh, the University of Toronto, through Richard Landon, the former director of the Fisher Library, was doing what they could to support her in the last years including by acquiring her papers, which we now possess, along with her journals, which I'm told are to be published, but that was two years ago, so I'm not sure where they're at right now. There is a kind of myth that has developed over the years that Mavis Gallant was and is unknown and unread in Canada, the, the land of her birth. It is certainly true that she is not as well known in Canada as other writers of her generation, notably Margaret Atwood and Mordecai Richler. There are a number of good reasons for this, starting with the fact that she wrote short stories, not novels. Unlike Atwood and Richler, she was neither especially good at or even terribly interested in promoting herself and her work and she spent her entire writing career in another country. But she did get as much or more attention than most Canadian writers of her generation here in Canada. She gave interviews on CBC TV and radio. She got coverage in the big magazines. Her stories show up in classroom anthologies, then and now. State recognition, she won the Order of Canada in 1981 the Priyathas David from Quebec in 2006. She's actually the first writer, Quebec writer writing in English to win that award. And it is also very hard for me to think of someone who had 116 stories in the New Yorker as an ignored writer. You know, they may not know what the New Yorker is in Paris. I find that hard to believe, but we certainly know what it is in Canada. A writer like Mavis Gallant, writing the way she does, in the form she does, is never going to be a household name. And I think that's really all the complaint is. When we're saying she's unread, we just mean that she's not popular. But given her form, given her style, that was never going to happen anyway. Her biggest fans and her best champions have tended to be other writers. Janice Kula Kiefer, Michael Helm, Lisa Moore, and many others. Michael Andachi has said, I know authors who admit that the one writer they do not read when they are completing a book is Mavis Gallant. Nothing could be more intimidating. Clark Blaze, who's no slouch himself, calls her simply Canada's greatest writer. Russell Banks says he doesn't know of a better American short story writer since Eudora Welty. The American writer, young American writer, Junpa Lahiri, said, the first story I read, which was the ice wagon going down the street, 
broke something in me. Something about my prior understanding of what a story can do and how. When Hiri was 30, trying to decide if she was a writer, she asked her parents to give her Galant's selected stories for Christmas. And she says, reading those stories put an end to the question, put the summit before me, and put me on my path. Mavis Galant's writing is dense, challenging. It is thick with facts, with observations, with complicated irony, and complex emotions. Francine Prose says that her short stories aren't novels, as some have said, they're encyclopedias. You cannot read her stories quickly, and you would be wise to take her advice and read them one at a time. Let them sit. I can understand uh, people not caring for Gallant's subjects, the minutiae of class, ethnic, or racial division differences between people. I can see people saying, that's not for me, subject-wise. I get that. But if you give her her subject, which is what we have to do for writers, I don't know of a better writer. I generally enjoy Alice Munro more, but I admire Mavis Gallant more, if you see the difference. It's that observant eye. It's her care in every single sentence. It's her intelligence, her towering intelligence. I'm glad that I came to her late, um, because she has pretty much ruined every other writer for me. And I will stop there. Thank you, folks.